in leading off this session, uh, I, I wanted to set the topic in a, um, uh, a, a broader context and raise some questions about um, what we do well and uh, where some, some things need to be uh, thought about more critically, perhaps, uh, cautions we might take. Um, I hope it helps to set the scene a bit for the uh, presentations and the discussion that might follow. Unfortunately, we are uh, <coughs> rather short of time, so um, this is going to have to be a bit more compressed than I had planned, but uh, we'll see if that works. <coughs> so this is the outline. Um, just um, ba basically 10 working slides, and uh, the first four will define some concepts and context, then a couple of slides uh, <coughs> asking about some of, the, some of the pitfalls, some of the things we need to be mindful of as we move uh, increasingly into uh, the arena of adaptation. Uh, <coughs> I've coined that word adaptists. I hope it's not regarded as a um, pejorative term. I, I couldn't think of any other official term that exists and uh, I have to say I suppose I was subliminally influenced by that um, uh <coughs> constant irritant um, Pearson, who writes in The Australian, who I think coined the phrase warmists. You're, you're all warmists. Um, then a couple of slides on uh, demographic and temporal scale issues, uh, and a final um, discussion of um, the, the trade-offs between a mitigation approach and an adaptation approach with respect to uh, reductions of risk. Now, this is a fairly conventional representation of um, how we think about the, the total risk management process, uh, and I'm not going to go through that in any detail, but there are a few uh, points that I'd like to make about it. Just at the macroscopic level, you'll see those uh, three colored um, rectangles, and the one at the top refers to the, um, the initial task of actually finding out what the causal relationships, what the influence uh, of cl climatic change and variation is on particular outcomes, defining risk functions uh, through empirical studies, using that information uh, to model future risks given certain assumptions, certain scenarios about the future. And that's, um, that's primary work that has to be done and uh, uh, is, is ongoing, I think, in all of the impact sectors that we're interested in at this uh, conference. Then in the, the green, uh, there's the first order business, the business of um, actually reducing or eliminating the, the hazard, climate change. And uh, you'll, you'll see that there's a reference to co-benefits there, which I'll come back to in just a moment. And then uh, in the blue rectangle at the bottom, um, the the focus of our, our discussions at this meeting to do with um, uh, risk reduction on the way, adaptation. Now I want to make uh, just several points um, about, about this slide. Firstly, uh, and we had a discussion about this at our workshop yesterday to do with uh, uh, adaptation research in relation to human health risks, impacts from climate change. Uh, how do we think about this continuum between, in the first instance, understanding where the risks are and what form the risk function takes, uh, versus thinking about what options we have for interventions, for modifications of one kind or another to reduce those risks. A sort of continuum of research across there from the... Um, the basic information needs through to the, um, the practical policy applications. And uh, it's never been clear as to whether there's a, a clear dividing line here that should be guiding uh, res research policy in this uh, country, at least in the, um, uh, the health impacts area. Obviously our National Health and Medical Research Council uh, has been somewhat confused about where there might be a division and what constitutes adaptation research. But the um, point of that arrow on the right-hand side is to um, 
really indicate there is a continuity and you, you can't sensibly move into that blue rectangle until you've got pretty good information uh, out of the red rectangle. Now, there are three other points quickly to mention. Um, firstly, and um, uh, Jean, I think, talked about win-win situations. In the mitigation area, and we would have heard about this today, actually, I think from um, Professor Andrew Haynes from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who was going to present by video, and would have talked about the um, importance of understanding the benefits that can flow immediately to local populations uh, when they, as communities and their governments, uh, take mitigation actions of the kind we're very familiar with that would result in cleaner air and more energy efficient um, th thermally protected housing, uh, different um, uh, di dietary systems, production processes, types of foods uh, and associated methane emissions, for example. He would have talked about that. Uh, that is an example of a win-win um, a situation in the mitigation uh, box there. There's also a, um, a red dot connecting the green and the blue, um, and that's to remind us that, um, again, the differentiation uh, between mitigation and adaptation is not always clear cut. There are some things that are both. Uh, if we put better insulation in the um, roofing of our houses, uh, then uh, we achieve gains on both fronts. The house becomes more energy efficient, uh, but it also becomes more thermally protective. And then the third dot uh, stresses a very important point uh, for those of us in and around the health sector, and I guess this applies generally, that while there are adaptation tasks that are appropriately undertaken in specialised fashion just by that sector, rather more are going to need to be taken on an intersectoral and interdisciplinary basis. And uh, I, I simply want to emphasise there that whether we're talking about short-term immediate adaptation responses or longer term, um, the, t the task for the health sector must include an increasing uh, readiness and capacity to engage with other sectors and to understand uh, what the, the planning for the future will necessarily in, in, um, involve as a, um, as a joint, as a cooperative exercise in thinking and planning. Now, just some sort of larger overarching issues here. Uh, and I've given some examples along the way, so I don't need to explore this in detail. But um, we do need a wider understanding of the full range of health risk. We, we, we tend to see reflected in public discussion and media reports a rather simplistic view that it's essentially about heat waves and mosquitoes. Uh, and those are important, uh, but it's much bigger than that. And I'll show a slide on that in a moment. And there's that point also about the, um, uh, the, the health sector needing to broaden its field of vision um, because from the, the, the healthcare provision side, uh, so much of the thinking is about dealing with individuals and with families, and that's always important. Uh, but in fact, with things like climate change, we're talking about risks impinging on whole communities, whole regions, uh, and that's also a legitimate and important focus for the attention of the, um, uh, the health sector in asking itself, how do we engage in uh, understanding and taking action in relation to um, risks at that scale? There's the issue of governance um, and management of adaptation, needing supportive values within the culture, uh, literacy with respect to these matters, um, and enabling institutional structures um, I must say I was um, rather taken aback by Wendy Craig's view that um, most of the adaptation that uh, is being undertaken or needs to be undertaken um, doesn't require any involvement of government, that it's going to happen out there in the community anyway. Now I think lots and lots of things will happen and are happening in the community, but frankly I cannot imagine uh, a comprehensive approach to adaptation at the, at the scale and over the time horizons we require um, being successfully formulated and implemented uh, without our, our governments, local, state, national, international, uh, being substantially involved in this. Um, of course, it's easy to say uh, that's what we need, but um, there is a question about um, the political tide and the 
prevailing ideologies and so on. In, uh, in Britain, there's been an interesting debate recently about the, um, uh, the problem of a, a modern form of enclosures. You'll recall the, the history of rural enclosures from 17th and 18th century England and Scotland and so on, when the commons were taken over um, and, and, and privatised. Uh, and that's been happening in the urban setting in, in the late uh, 20th century, where government has been saying to pr the private sector, look, you take this uh, un unoccupied land and develop it uh, as, um, uh, as communal space. But it's been done by the private sector and that's resulted in an unsatisfactory set of constraints on patterns of use, uh, on reliance on um, uh, uh, in, in, intensive commercial development around these spaces in order to generate money for the, pri the now private owners and developers. And that's being rethought. Boris Johnson, the tousled Tory, the Mayor of London, uh, is saying, we've got to rethink this. The, the, this is uh, urban land that belongs to the public. They have a right to go into it. There should be no constraints. And if we're going to be able to adapt to climate change, uh, we've got to be able to do it as a whole community according to what we understand is needed. That's the role for government. And then, um, uh, finally, I've mentioned the, um, uh, the, the need to, uh, m m to move on and uh, uh, approach much of the adaptation um, research in um, a, 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 more a more formal uh, way than I think to date many of us have been able to do. We're still finding our feet with respect to the types of uh, research designs that will give us useful answers. Uh, and one of the, con uh, one of the caveats here, uh, and, and Jean, I think, again mentioned this, um, is the, uh, the, street, the street lamppost um, problem of uh, then confining your, your uh, research to those areas that are most amenable to formal research as we already know and do it, uh, to the exclusion of tackling uh, via different methods and with different concepts, rather bigger and, uh, in, all, in many cases, uh, longer horizon issues. Now, um, <coughs> I'm going to run through this very quickly. This is a bit of a horror. It's a sort of multivariate Heath Robinson that I'll build up. But it's going to make the point that f flowing out of all of these changes, disruptions, losses, deficits, uh, that we anticipate coming from climate change, uh, the great majority of them will ultimately uh, have adverse consequences for some aspects of, uh, of uh, human health. So you see there at the top um, a layer of, um, or a stratum of um, first order impacts, things that we are becoming well aware of and are concerned about, and many of those having economic consequences. Over there on the right, uh, is the, um, uh, the recognisable effect of uh, extremes of um, weather, heat waves, uh, for example, and the, the rather direct consequences um, for, uh, for health, including um, hospitalisations, injuries and death. But in the medium to longer term, um, in this country and elsewhere, many of the, uh, the more serious risks to health are going to flow from the, the second stratum of consequences relating uh, to the, uh, the basic foundations of population health in the long term, to do with food and water and microbial um, patterns and so on. And uh, you would guess that flowing out of those is this whole range of um, impacts on <coughs> human biology um, and human health and uh, prospects for um, survival and longevity. Now, that's not quite the end of the story. Uh, on a, an international scale, and that includes, uh, as we heard this morning, a need to think about the Asia and Pacific region and what the consequences of um, incre increasing environmental and geopolitical instability in this region might mean. The patterns of human deprivation, movement, uh, misery, uh, health consequences. Um, and um, that's why you'll see uh, there on that left-hand side, uh, this reference to uh, the um, problems of conflicts and displacement likely to flow uh, if current trajectories persist, climate change uh, trajectories. And um, 
there it is, that fo follows through via um, people relocation, for example, to a number of adverse outcomes. So it's, a, it's actually a much more complex story than the, uh, the heat waves and mozzies one, and so many of these intersect with so many other of the sectors that uh, we're all working in. Uh, one quick example of um, then how we might think about uh, simple adaptation issues within the, uh, uh, the health arena field. And I hope Chris Ebay is comfortable with my terminology here. She's uh, the international expert on defining these, uh, these, these terms to do with vulnerability, adaptation, and so on. But we have an external exposure. We have a constitutional sensitivity of the exposed group. Put that together and you can start to think about the health risks that exist, the potential level. In fact, what we want to know is what the actual eventual vulnerability, real vulnerability of that um, exposed group will be. Uh, and that's where uh, we, we have to ask ourselves what can adaptation contribute to um, lessening um, the risk, lessening the vulnerability. There are latent resources there, and if we can harness those at these sorts of levels in relation to dealing with extremes of heat, and you can read through the sorts of examples I've put, uh, then that will um, influence the extent to which the potential health risk translates into um, um, true vulnerability and actual uh, health outcome. Right, some pitfalls. This was originally three pitfalls, but I realise it's only two and a half. Uh, but they are that um, it, it's easy to be tempted into this assumption that we can just cope bit by bit uh, as the problem gradually unfolds. But this assumes that notion of a gradual and manageable linear increase in risk. And we've heard already, and we'll hear again at this, um, this meeting, that um, this, this is not a realistic interpretation of how the future is likely to unfold. Uh, so that uh, we, we do need to be looking to those longer time horizons and asking ourselves bigger questions that I'll come to in just a moment. The second one, um, I think this is a, a, a moral and a political issue that we, we have to bear in mind that um, uh, if we persist in a world of basically com competing parallel nation states, then the rich countries, if they will, uh, have the resources to, in a, in a sense, go it alone um, and um, increase their, um, their protective uh, armour against climate change. Um, but that would, uh, of course, run risks to a very very large proportion of the world that are not able to uh, follow suit. And then that um, final point is more specifically directed at the, uh, the health sector. Um, and uh, th there's a problem here that while the health sector can easily engage in some contributions to mitigation by uh, uh, reducing its carbon footprint and so on, can do that on its own, so much of the adaptation that is going to be needed uh, in relation to protecting human well-being, health and survival uh, is going to require them to look over the fence and to engage, as we've said, uh, with other sectors. No need to look at the, uh, bother about the detail here, but I have some examples coming out of Victoria and I'll just go through these uh, very quickly as I um, move towards uh, winding up. This is to make the point that, um, uh, <coughs> in fact, responses to climatic stresses um, are, are not linear, uh, by and large. And uh, when we're talking about risks of death during heat wave, there are countless examples of um, analyses that have been done in populations all around the world, showing this curvilinear response as temperatures rise, um, and uh, that it, uh, at, at some point, that rise becomes very steep. We've seen it in um, the 2003 heat wave in Europe, in Paris, some very good data showing that while there was a, an average heat wave that involved about a seven, eight degree centigrade excursion above seasonal norm in uh, mid-July in that year, there were about 100 extra deaths attributed to that in, um, statistically uh, in, in Paris. Uh, a few weeks later when the, the big one came, lasted for about 12 days in early August, the, the, uh, the temperature excursion was not seven or eight degrees, but about 12 degrees. Uh, and the death toll was not 100, but 900. 
you know, a critical point had been passed in terms of human coping capacity. And uh, that similar experience in Melbourne and in Adelaide in 2009 when these very unusual temperatures of up to 46 degrees in, in Melbourne, for example, caused this rapid escalation uh, mm -hmm. of um, uh, biological distress and calls on the health service. Um, ways that we might then think about the categories of adaptive responses needed, and Mark Stafford-Smith is probably in the audience, and uh, he presented this at the, these, um, these three levels of adaptation to us two years ago at uh, the equivalent conference. And um, we, we just should note, without going through each of those examples explicitly, that um, a lot of what we are doing in the first instance is incremental adaptation, and that seemed to be what the Productivity Commission is saying uh, we might best concentrate on, because that's where the relative certainty lies. Uh, that's important, but um, uh, I think we, we, we've got to be able to look further ahead and begin to think in more transitional terms about uh, making changes that will bring benefits over the longer term, beginning to re uh, reshape the form of our urban landscapes, for example. Uh, but ultimately, it's very likely we're going to have to, um, well, certain on <laughs> How we under, given how we understand um, the, the science of climate change, it's certain that we're going to have to take some transformative actions, some big changes. Uh, and these are going to be more, um, of course, difficult and controversial. Um, but I think we shouldn't sideline them at this stage just on the grounds that there's more uncertainty about them. We've got to find ways of beginning to bring that thinking uh, into our culture and our practice, because that can't happen overnight. I just uh, then have uh, a couple of examples. Um, so um, if uh, Dave Griggs is in the audience, uh, thank you for sending me the report from the Monash Sustainability Institute recently, the annual report. I did read it. And as I read it, I thought, well, these are a couple of interesting examples of, um, uh, of research into adaptation, one of them at the individual level. Uh, what role can... Um, general practitioner engagement and education of patients and families play uh, in uh, shoring up the defences, the personal defences, behaviours against climate change. Uh, and then uh, that very different one on the right-hand side with a community focus. Some research asking what would a climate adapted settlement look like in 2030. And these are two very different scales of questions in the um, adaptation uh, arena. And likewise, when we think about Victoria's uh, recent experiences of chronic rural stress during the drought and the acute bushfire uh, in 2009, here are two examples of um, uh, where adaptation is, is needed. Um, and they're, they're rather different ones. We talk about increasingly the need to build resilience in rural communities as a longer term strategy. Uh, whether we to call that transitional or transformative would depend just on how far we might go. But those are um, <coughs> clearly, you know, big, uh, it's a big deal challenge, but quite difficult to subject to formal uh, research evaluation of a cost, cost benefit or cost effectiveness kind. On the other hand, the one at the bottom is rather more straightforward, and you might think of that as at least temporary incremental adaptation, or if the hospitals, as they are now doing, have got plans in place for how to respond to these issues, then this is their incremental um, uh, response by, um, uh, by shoring up their own um, uh, f facilities and staff capacities to deal with such occasional surges, perhaps less occasional in future. And then finally, um, are we going for depth or breadth? This is a comparison of mitigation and adaptation. Uh, I hope this slide works. It seemed to me to the, the, the two dimensions which one can think about um, uh, what we're seeking to achieve via these interventions. Uh, <coughs> I've listed six sectors that are involved in the, the NCARF work, uh, just as examples. Uh, above the line, and that's showing um, the climate change added impact 
on those sectors, but you'll see below that, um, that line uh, in the, um, uh, the, the dotted rectangles, the, the pre-existing level of problem or deficit with things like burdens of health that are already there, rates of diarrheal disease that, that would go up in a warmer world, um, problems with water supply in the Murray-Darling Basin that would be exa exacerbated uh, in a climate change world. Now, uh, mitigation, of course, um, skims off that top risk, or seeks to, for all sectors, whereas adaptation um, can dig deeper into any one sector, perhaps one or two, but it's, uh, it's focused vert vertically. So to see that visually, his um, mitigation, <coughs> giving those six problems a haircut. So uh, ideally we can uh, eliminate the climate change um, attributable portion of, um, of, of risk or problem. Whereas adaptation, thinking of the health sector, uh, at least is seeking to reduce or eliminate that part of it, um, but can go a lot further because it's one of these win-win situations where in any sector, if the adaptation is, uh, you know, is a good mainstream intervention, then of course it will help to reduce the underlying um, pre-climate change problem as well. And that brings me to the end. That's all. <laughs>